If you have a, a Bible with you that you brought, you could join me in John chapter 6, where we're going to be for this week's message. If you didn't bring a Bible or an app where you can get onto God's Word, we always put the verses up on the screen for you. But John chapter 6, title of my message is Soul Food. Soul Food from John chapter 6. Um, there's a lot of eating we do. Uh, we all eat things every day. And... Um, we don't just eat regular food, though that's normally what we think of. When we talk about eating, we think about what goes in our belly. Uh, but also, it can apply to what goes in our mind. I mean, if someone tells you something you hadn't thought of before, you might say, that's food for thought. That's, that's food for thought. Or if you bought a new book and it was ridiculous, and I said to you, man, how was that, how was that new book? You might say, I couldn't put it down. I devoured it. And you're talking about information being assimilated, but you're speaking of it as food. So the the point is, there's there's more than one kind of food. And what we're going to see in John's gospel, the sixth chapter, is that there's another kind of food that's not even uh, a kind of food that goes in your stomach, nor is it a kind of food that goes into your mind. It's a kind of food that goes into your soul. And the thesis is that this is the most important kind of food. Why? Here we go. Because a full stomach is temporary, but a full soul is forever. That's That's my whole message in a sentence. Boom, done. I'm out of here. See you guys. No, but that's it. That's the talk. A full soul is forever. Full mind or a full stomach, that's that's just, that's temporary. All right, so so John 6. What's been going on before we, we jump in here? We don't have time to read the whole chapter. It's a great, long chapter, a lot of action. The skinny is this. Jesus and his disciples, they were tired. They had been busting it, man. I mean, they had been, they had been going hard. They had, they had just got off the 16 and a half hour flight from Johannesburg to Atlanta, one of the longest flights you could take on this earth, and they were tired. That's stressful. That's hectic. They had a, they had a newborn baby with them on the flight. Man, that, that kid didn't, didn't like it much, the time zones and whatnot. Um, neither did his dad. So they, being tired as they were, Jesus said to his disciples, guys, we need to take a break. There's an old uh, proverb that says, if you always keep the bow bent, it will snap. You need to let the bow relax, let the string relax. And so it is when it comes to your life. If you don't take the wisdom of how God created the world with a day off at the end of six days, you're you're not working well for yourself. You you need to to make sure and and build rest into the rhythms of your life. So Jesus told his disciples, guys, we need to come apart. Someone, Someone said, if you don't come apart to rest, you'll come apart at the seams. And so uh, it's really powerful to see Jesus leading in that way. The funny thing was, though, someone posted on TMZ where they were resting, you know, where they were going to hang out. And you think I'm joking. Everybody showed up. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people showed up where Jesus and his disciples were trying to rest. That'll happen when you heal people. (laughs) They'll They'll tell all their sick friends, you know. And so everyone wanted to get healed. Everyone wanted to get helped. And the disciples were irritated, but Jesus was moved with compassion. So he began to speak to them, began to minister to them. And and then the day grew late. So the disciples said, OK, guys, you've had your sermon. Get out of here. And and Jesus said, but they're hungry. And and Peter and the disciples were like, be that as it may, I I don't bring any food for them. You didn't bring any food for them. Costco's closed. I I don't know what you want us to do for thousands. There's 5,000 men plus women and children. 20,000 people is the estimate of what was actually in the crowd on that day. And so here's what happened. Jesus said, well, what do you have? Where we tend to focus on what we don't have, Jesus will always ask, well, what do you have? You think, I can't do something great because I don't have this opportunity, haven't been given that chance, don't have this resource. Well, God always wants to work within your means. He always wants to work within the, the realm of what he has. In tr- he knows what he gave you, and he knows what he didn't give you. The elements of a miracle are always within your reach. They're always there for you to grab. And so he says, what do you have? And of course, you know, they said, well, there's this kid. He's got a Lunchable. He, he brought a Lunchable. His mom packed him up a Capri Sun. Just a couple of those Ritz crackers and some of that gross lunch meat, right? <laughs> Five loaves and two fish. And, but then the disciples said, what are they among so many? Jesus said, bring them to me. And he blessed what they brought him. He'll always bless what you bring him. The problem is some of us despise what we have because it's not a lot, so we don't bring him anything. But that gives him nothing to bless. 
But if you give him what you do have and start there, he can make more out of it. He can begin to multiply what's put into his hand in faith. Some of you didn't give in the offering today because you don't have a lot. But instead, you could have chosen to give out of your little and seen the blessing of God upon your little, and he'll work with what you give him. So the blessing started with that tiny little insignificant gift. And so, of course, you know the story. Spoiler alert, he fed everybody to where they were glutted. And there were 12 baskets of fragments left over, a doggy bag for each of the 12 disciples. They were pumped. They were like, yeah. <laughs> each of them. <laughs> That's how I read the Bible. Right? <laughs> and uh, pray for me. Um, so uh, now they've eaten. The people are fired up. And Jesus says, OK, now we're going to, while they're all lying there in a food coma, we're going we're gonna to make our break, right? So he sends the disciples down to the dock. He loads them up in a boat with a basket, each of them. And I don't have time to preach about this. But I would preach, if I had time, about how they got into a storm. But the, and they started freaking out. But all they needed to do when they were freaking out is look at their feet, at their feet where there was a basket of fragments from the last miracle. And they, if they would have looked down at the, at the remainder of the last miracle, they wouldn't have doubted in this one, because they would have remembered he was faithful back then. He's going to be faithful today. And some of you, the problem is you're forgetful about what he did last time. So you get into a pickle, and you forget to look at the basket of fragments of what he did last time. You're stressing out because of this new situation. All you need to do is keep some scraps in a doggy bag from what he did back then. And you could say, if he was faithful three years ago, he'll be faithful today. If you got the doggy bag from the last Last miracle, you won't have to worry about this one. But I don't got time to preach about that, so I won't. Instead, I'll say that Jesus went to pray while the disciples were stuck in a storm that he sent them through. And I wish I had time to preach about how he said, go to the other side. And they began to think they were going to die in the middle. But if he told you to go to the other side, you're never going to die in the middle. He's got, he's, you, he gave you within his command the enabling to do what he told you to do. But again, I'm not trying to preach about that miracle. Quit trying to make me. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> so they finally make it to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And Jesus decides it's about time uh, to, get, to come with them. So you know, you know the story. I don't, I don't have time to get into it. He, he, he crossed the water, too, but he did so on foot across the water. He walked on water, as one does when one is the son of God. So. <laughs> He, he goes across the sea. The disciples went across the sea in a boat. Jesus went across the, the, the lake on a, on, a, on a water skiing trip. No boat, just water skiing. No, no skis, just water walking. And um, the disciples and Jesus are now on the other side, OK? And they're all excited because they're going to get their much needed rest and relaxation. But the people who uh, had had a delicious meal are now waking up from their food coma. And they're like, uh, we, need, we need some more food. And they took all the leftovers with them. We need some more food. We're hungry. So they start looking for Jesus, because he's the guy who gives out fish tacos. <laughs> Flat bread and fish. What, do you, what would you think? I, I put a little sriracha on it. Call it a day, guys. That's what I'm saying. So I never ex got excited about five loaves and two fish till I started thinking about it. It's pretty much fish tacos. And then I was more excited about it. So, so they're looking for Jesus. They go down. They had seen the disciples leaving the boat, but they knew Jesus was up on the mountain praying. They thought he was still up there. But they checked. He's gone. They go down to the dock, and they say, hey, did, did Jesus come across? They go, no, no, he didn't, he didn't come across. No, no more boats left after the disciples. And so they all, all the people, thousands of people get into boats, and they cross the lake, too. And when they get to the other side, they see Jesus and the disciples are there. And they rush up to Jesus, and they say, how would you get here? How would you get here? That's all they want to know. How would you get here? And now we're ready. We're all caught up. Look at it. It's in John 6, 26. Jesus answered them and said, most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not, someone say, do not, do not. labor for the food which perishes, but labor for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? This is the dumbest thing I've ever heard anybody say in my entire life. 
If you do something awesome, we'll believe in you. He just fed them miraculously <laughs> with a little kid's lunchbox. What, what, what more proof do you need? You know, the quest to get proof in order to believe, that's one of those common things. If I saw God do a miracle, then I believe. No, you wouldn't. Jesus said, if you saw someone rise from the dead, you wouldn't believe if you didn't believe at the preaching of the word. You see, you have to have faith that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So these people who had seen a sign still didn't believe him because the sign only exists to point to the sermon. And if you don't listen in response to the sermon, no matter how many signs you see, no matter how miraculous things that God does, you'll find a way to write it off or, or, or to still keep persisting in your unbelief. So they, they got a sign. What do they want? Another sign. They got a meal. They, what do they want? Another meal. How do you know that's what they want? Well, notice what they suggest him to do. We'll believe you if, look at this, verse 31. Our fathers ate the manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Oh, that's tricky of them. Why? The bread from heaven in the wilderness wanderings lasted 40 years. So they're being sly. They're like, that meal was great. But, but if you give us bread for 40 years, then we'll, then we'll really believe that you're well played. Well played, guys. Verse 32, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Yes. Then they said to him, that's awesome, Lord. Give us that kind of bread always. Give us that bread always. If there's living bread we don't know about, give us that bread. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And he who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. There's something magnificent about the number seven. There's just something about that number. It's everywhere. There are seven continents on this planet. There are seven wonders of the ancient world. You probably know that within the musical scale, there are seven notes, the Western scale anyhow. And inside of every rainbow, there are seven colors. Seven, 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 seven books in the Harry Potter series. Whoa. Whoa, seven. It's, it's every, there are seven bones in the neck of almost all mammals. There are seven spots commonly found on any given ladybug. Seven is everywhere, even within you and within me. They say that seven is the number of days it takes for your skin to regenerate itself. Every seven days, you have a new layer of skin covering your entire body, your epidermis. A whole new layer of skin is on the outside of you. And, and what happened to the old uh, layer? You vacuumed it up. You dusted it up. The majority of dust found in any building is all human skin. That's no longer needed it because like a snake, you just sloughed it off every seven days. But your body, that's gross, right? Your body is an entirely new version of itself in totality every seven years. For every single cell in your body is basically uh, brand new every seven years. So you're a brand new you uh, every time seven years goes by. Your, your memory, uh, too, has a connection to the number seven. They say seven is this, this magical number that, that represents the upper limits of our working memory or what they refer to as channel capacity. What, is, what does that mean? Here's what it means. If I rattled off a series of letters or numbers, almost every one of you would be fine up to seven plus or minus two. Some people hang on till nine. Some people are, uh, they drop out at five. And you'd be like, that's me. Simple Simon, never did well at that. You know, like that game, you know, remember, remember those games? You had to like remember the colors. Red, blue, five, green, five, five, I don't know. I don't know. Pull it, bop it, <laughs> tap it, punch it, right? So, uh, so seven is basically how many we can hang on to, which is why there are seven numbers in every phone number in America. They experimented with other numbers, but they found that uh, if they went up to eight, the amount of wrong numbers when people were calling each other, if, is that, if that's still a thing that is done, when you're not texting each other, right? That, that if they went up to eight, the amount of wrong dials skyrocketed. 
And the Bell Telephone Company, when they were deciding this, uh, they, they wanted the biggest number possible so that they would have to have fewer area codes because you know how exponential increase works in, in compound interest. The, just even adding one more number to it opens up a whole new uh, plethora of possibilities. Uh, but they had to stick with seven because uh, most of us can hang on up to seven. The psychologist George Miller, in his prolific and, and very well widely respected essay, Seven, the magic number, plus or minus two, that's the title of it, uh, had this to say. He said, there seems to be some limitation built into us, either by learning or by the design of our nervous systems, a limit that keeps our channel capacities in this general range of seven. Now, seven is also a number that you find magnificently displayed across the entire panorama of scripture, from Genesis, where seven represents the prototypical week, seven days to the week, six and one, six days of work and then that day of resting, and all the way across to Revelation, uh, where you have sevens everywhere. There are seven letters to seven churches. There are seven trumpets. There are seven seals. There are seven bowls. In fact, seven shows up in the Bible so often. Someone added them up. And would you believe it? There are 700 instances of the number, God, you're just showing off now, right, in the Bible. And one of those sevens is seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus chose to identify himself to us by telling us who he is. And one of those we just read, he is the bread of life. And what we're going to be doing in these magical days is we're going to be a week at a time grabbing one of these statements where Jesus says who he is in his own words. This isn't someone else talking about him. This isn't like, here's what I think Jesus is like. This is Jesus in his own words. This is Jesus from his own mouth. And he's going to tell us seven times who he is. And the seven in the scripture represents completion or fullness like a full week or like a full rainbow or like the fullness of the musical scale. He's going to tell us fully in his mouth who he is. And I love that he didn't choose 11. I love that he didn't choose 19. I love that he said, no, no, I want you to be able to hang on to this. You'd forget if I told you 14 things about me. But I think you'll be able to hang on to the fact that I am the bread of life. I am the true vine. I am the door. I am the shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am, I am, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I think we'll save that one for Easter Sunday, seven weeks from today, and we'll celebrate the risen, triumphant, magnificent, resplendent king who saved us from our sins and has his, our names written on the palm of his hand. Seven times the upper limit of our working memory, our channel capacity. Jesus says, you want to know who I am? Here's who I am. And we're starting with, I am the bread of life, which is so important for us to delve into. Because number one, jot this down, we tend to focus only on what we eat physically. That's why I think he began with this one. Because he was speaking to a group of people who pretty much only were in it for what they could get out of it for their stomach. Right? They, 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 they followed him across the lake, and all they wanted was more food. Jesus just called them out. He's like, y'all are a bunch of moochers. You don't, you don't want nothing to do with me. You don't care about me. You only want more food food. You only want more food. Now, food is important. Otherwise, he wouldn't have given them food at all. Food is important. It's important to feed people. But again, Jesus used the giving of the food to point to something that was more important, something below the surface. Here's the thing you need to know. The, the, the sign was only meant to point to the sermon. The sermon was full of the substance. And they, 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 they ignored the sermon and only cared about the sign. But imagine how silly that would be if you saw a sign in your thirst, maybe walking through an airport, you saw a sign that said drinking fountain this way, and you went up to the sign and started licking it. <laughs> that wouldn't satisfy your need. The sign's meant to point to the sermon. If you, if you went to the, if you, again, you use another airport analogy, that's all I have. It's really all I know. If you, <laughs> if you went to an airport and it said, flight number 6545 to LAX right here, and there was a sign that said that, and you sat in a chair and wondered when you were going to be in LAX. No, the sign was pointing to the gate where you enter a plane that's going to take you somewhere. The sign doesn't get you there. It just tells you where to get to where you need to be so you can get to where you want to be. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and all of Jesus 
Jesus' miracles, they were, they were merely signs. He said that Moses' pouring down of bread from heaven, the manna that fell from heaven, that was merely a sign. That wasn't supernatural bread. That was just regular bread that was meant to illustrate the fact that there's coming a day when real bread is going to come to heaven. And that day's now. And you're missing it because all you care about is getting more bread. All you care about is what you're putting into your stomach. It's easy to live that way because the needs of our physical bodies are so pressing and we can't see our spirits and we have never been to heaven and we've never gotten to see hell. So all we see is this physical world that we are trapped in. But let me just tell you something. It's all temporary. It's all temporary. Not only are you a different version of yourself every seven years, so your body clearly isn't even you. It's just a, a house you live in that's in the process of becoming a different one you're going to live in seven years from now. But you yourself are your soul because the day's going to come when not only is your mom going to stop vacuuming up your last layer of skin that's now turned into dust, but your entire body is going to turn into dust after you die. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But you are not your body. You have a body. You are a soul. And when your body turns to ash or dust, you are going to be standing before God. And in Jesus' words, from there, it's either judgment or it's life. It's blessing or it's cursing. And he's saying, I'm the difference between those two things. Because food that, that you eat now, it, it can only give you energy. But it's going to perish Food spoils, it goes bad, you eat it, it's eliminated, and you're hungry again. And isn't that a picture of how so many people live on this earth? Looking to get high, get, needing to get high again. Looking to get wasted, waking up hungover, needing to get drunk again. No one ever gets drunk and goes, that's it, I never need to get drunk again. That was the greatest experience of my life. I ne never need that again. Next Friday, I'm gonna get drunk. no, I was drunk last Friday. It was awesome. Never need to do that again. No, the, the payoff is needing more. And you sleep with someone. You're swiping right and swiping wrong. And swi all, and what, what's the payoff? The payoff is needing to do that again and again and again. That's why they say sexual dysfunction and addiction is skyrocketing along with those who are utilizing the apps that facilitate, facilitate casual sexual encounters. And people are deleting and reinstalling the app compulsively. Never again, one more time. 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 The payoff for taking in is needing to take in again. And so that's a mistake to only focus on what we eat. What we need to be focused more on is not just what we eat, but what we need. What we need. And that is bread of a different sort. That's bread of a different kind entirely. The most important eating we do is spiritually. The most important eating we do is spiritually. Listen to me very carefully. What you're truly hungry for is not more followers on Instagram, is not more money in the bank account, it's not fine meals and fancy trips. It's, it's not any of the things that in this body we hunger for. What we truly are hungry for is God. Yeah, yeah. And that's why Jesus said, listen to me, I am the bread of life. You are speaking to me, asking me for more bread and more fish. But you should be asking me to give you what will truly satisfy the ache of your soul, a relationship with me. We don't need something from God. We just need God. And so often, we do the same thing they did. Here, here, listen. This is the guy who framed the world with his breath. Every star in the sky, it came because of the creative energy coming from Jesus' mouth. Through the power of God's spirit, everything that was made was made. And at the end of the world, it's going to be remade in perfection, where there's not going to be sin or disease or death or decay anymore. That's all what's in store for us. And it's going to happen because of Jesus. He's going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. He's the one who's going to return. He's the one who's even now working in people's lives, seeking to show himself kind toward them. And they, in that day, had the opportunity to speak to him. And what they do? They rushed up to him. And then in, in front of the one who made them, knit them together in their mother's womb, had the potential to save them, had the potential to set them free and to ignite them onto a whole brand new life of purpose and mission. And they said, you got any more of that bread? Hey, you got any of those chilies, gift certificates lying around? Right? That's all they, wow. he was just sad, thinking of what he could have given them. But they were, they were focused only carnally. They were only focused on walking on sight level, not by faith level. But we do the same thing. We have the opportunity to pray and speak to God. And so often we're in such a hurry just to ask him for things 
that would forget about the power of just being with him. And many of the things we spend our prayer lives praying for are perishable things that in two or three days or two or three years, or think about it, within 10 years, most of the things we are thinking about today are going to be in a, good, in a goodwill or in a trash heap somewhere. You, you go clearing out your garage, clearing out your, your closet. It's stuff that at one point mattered so much to you. But now, what does it matter? It's just, it's, it's all just, it's all just perished. But Jesus says, actually, what you need is me. We don't need more things. From, I just feel like God wants me to tell us as a church in the season, we don't need more things from God. We just need God. Nothing can replace just being with God and worshiping God and knowing God and loving God and becoming more like God. These are things that last forever. And make no mistake, within the seven I am statements of Jesus, he's declaring to be God. He's saying, I, I'm God. You need God, and I'm him. And you're like, I don't really see that within the text. Well, they would have, because they spoke Greek. And we don't speak Greek today, most of us. But if you actually look at this in the Greek, it's not, I am the bread of life. It's, 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 it's more interesting than that. There were two words in the Greek language that you would use if you were saying, I am. One was ego. You'll see it on the screen. Uh, ego, we, we get that because we would say someone's egocentric, meaning they're focused only on I am. And that, so you would use the verb ego to say, I am the bread of life. That would be normal. They, if he would have said that, they would have been like, eh, normal. There's another way you could say it. You could say, emi, emi the bread of life. And that would be another normal way to say emi. And I think we should go back to that. Emi hungry, right? <laughs> That's just, uh, emi. Uh, emi, meeny, miny, mo. Um, but Jesus didn't say ego, and Jesus didn't say emi. Instead, he said both of them. He said ego emi, the bread of life. Ego emi. And they would have all taken a step back and sucked in. Because what he said was, I am, I am the bread of life. You're like, uh, so Jesus has a stutter. OK. Major pain style. Got it. Uh, no, that was funnier than you responded. <laughs> Did I stutter? Um, no, he wasn't stuttering. This isn't the king's speech. Uh, this was him declaring to be the almighty God. You, some of you probably know because you took a Bethmore Bible study at one point in your life, and you, you, you heard that I am is one of the names of God. Actually, it's the first name that God ever gave to us. There are so many names of God because no one name could, could hold them all. But the name that he said is his name, that's not just an attribute, but actually who he is, is I am. It was back in the wilderness wanderings when Moses had uh, been in the wilderness by himself wandering around before he would lead God's people out of Egypt to the wilderness where they would wander. Or, or it's ironic how history repeats itself if you think about it. Uh, it's actually wild to know that Moses received the Ten Commandments on the same spot where he first encountered God. And you know how he first encountered God. It was when he was just walking one day and there was a bush that was on fire. That's not normal. No. Bush was on fire, and get this, it was talking to him, and it knew his name. <laughs> Moses. Moses didn't skip a beat. He's like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> what? Uh, and, and the bush had an assignment for him. Well, God, through the bush, wanted him to go in to Pharaoh, say, let my people go. You know the whole story. But Moses didn't think that the people would listen to him if he didn't know who God was that was talking to him. You have to realize, back then, they had very limited knowledge of God. All they knew was that he was the God that talked to Abraham. And so they would say, because there were so many gods worshipped back then, um, and there are still so many gods worshipped today, they just don't all have a name anymore. You're like, those old people with all their pagan deities. Oh, really? We just call it Mercedes-Benz today or Louis Vuitton today. I mean, we, have, we still have gods we worship. Um, many people worship their career, idolize their children uh, or, or a sport. You watch the Super Bowl, and you see people, and you're like, idolatry is still doing fine. Uh, don't pray for it. It's not struggling. It's not hurting. It's never been better. Um, but basically, Jesus uh, in that day was speaking to Moses, and all they knew him as was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses said, hey, I, I don't, I don't want to tell these people I should be your leader, you should follow me. And when they say, well, who told you this? And he'd have to go, a bush that was on fire, though. <laughs> like, that would be embarrassing. So, so he had the presence of mind to say this. Look at it. He said, no, nope, one back. Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, they're going to say to me, what's his name? And I'm going to say what? God said, look at this, God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And in the Greek Septuagint, which is the Hebrew translated into Greek, I am who I am is presented ego imi. That's the Bible that Jesus read. And so Jesus spoke up to these people on this day, and, and, and he said to them, when they said, I want bread, he said, ego imi. I am, I am the bread of life. Jesus was saying, I am God. And it's a perfect name for God, really, I am. Because we so often feel like we're limited. We feel like we're deficient. I don't know about you, but I, I spend so much time thinking what I'm not. But God's saying, I know you're not, but I am. I know you can't, but I can. I know you don't, but I will. I know you, you struggle, but I don't. I know you're inconsistent, but I'm not. I never change. I am who I am. Always was, always will be. I am. And let me tell you something. When you know his identity, it helps you figure out yours. This entire series is helping us see that I am changes who I am. Come on, somebody. When you know I am, it changes who you are. Moses was a different version of himself from that day forward because he knew I am. And where everything that would have terrified him before would have kept him paralyzed by fear, now he knew I am. I'm not, but he is. And so that's what Jesus was saying to them on that day. And that's what we actually need. We don't just need things from God. We actually, we need God. We need him. We're hungry for God. We're thirsty for God. And it's a mistake to live superficially only based on things that are, that are, that are here for a little bit, but then are going to be dissolved or, or sold in a thrift store and to miss out on what's most important. Didn't Isaiah the prophet actually call this out directly when he said in the message translation, why do you spend your money on junk food, your hard-earned cash on cotton candy? Listen to me. Listen well. Eat only the best. Fill yourself only with the finest. And he was using our life as currency. And he was saying, don't using your life as currency only spend it to buy cotton candy, that which tastes good for a second but then dissolves within your mouth. You, you utilize your, your energy to get the most important thing because regular food that you eat will give you energy. But Jesus, the bread of life, will let you tap into immortality, life now and forever. And that's what we actually need. C.S. Lewis put it well when he mused, I wonder sometimes whether all pleasures are not merely substitutes for joy. Wow. That there's true joy that can be found in God's presence. And anything else we look to to satisfy us is just a, a substitute for, for actual joy. The cool thing is, once you sink your teeth into the bread of life and taste it, and you see that God is good, then you can look back to this world, and you're actually positioned to enjoy bread properly. Here's what I'm saying. I don't think you got that. What I'm trying to say is bread, when it's looked to as a meal, is a mistake. Who else? Don't leave me alone up here. Who else has been there? The bread came out, and you went to town on the bread, <laughs> right? Too much bread, too much of a good thing. And then you're sad and hurting when the entree comes, and you're really discouraged when the dessert menu gets presented, right? But if you pace yourself, and if you know it's a, it's a, it's a nice occasion, it's an anniversary, it's a birthday, and you're like, you know, we're going to go appetizers, y'all. We're going, we're, going, we're going for dessert. You really pace yourself. So when the bread comes, you're thinking about what you're actually going to be satisfied by. So what can bread do? Bread can be bread. Here's what I do. I just pull the middle out. Screw that crust. I just want the middle <laughs> of the hot bread dipped into some balsamic vinegar and olive oil with a little bit of cracked pepper on top of it. How many of you know I'm preaching good on a cold Sunday? And a little bit of that. And they go, here's, here's it. You want me to bring out more bread? No. No, thank you. My mind's on the steak, and my steak's on my mind. Right? I'm thinking about what's actually going to satisfy me. So the bread can be bread. Here's what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say, when you know that Jesus is your bread, your living bread, then regular bread can just be regular bread. You can enjoy your job. You can enjoy your car. You can enjoy nice things without them dominating you. You can have them in your hand without letting them be in your heart. People and even pleasures on this earth can take their proper place without you looking to them to give you what they can never deliver. For they are not built to handle the weight of your soul. 
But when that rests on the great I am, then, hey, bread's awesome. Let's give God some praise for regular bread that we don't need to sustain us forever, because it can't. It's just bread. The bread comes, the bread goes. OK, I can be blessed, Paul said, no matter what's going on in my life. If I have a lot of bread, if I don't have a lot of bread, I'm good, because I got living bread. So that's what we eat. That's what we need. Thirdly, lastly, how do we receive it? I mean, how do we receive what we need? That was the question on the Jews' mind. They said, if you got living bread, how do we get it? And actually, the question they asked was, what work do we got to do for God to give it to us? And that's what we immediately go to, isn't it? Because we want to earn our keep. Because we can be proud about anything we earn. We can feel like we deserve it. We tend to make our relationship with God transactional where it should be relational. We come to him for transactions. Well, I went to church. Well, I'm doing good. Well, I read my Bible this week. We want a transactional relationship with God because then we're in control of it. But God will not be controlled. God will not not owe you anything. And he will not owe me anything. So here's what Jesus said. Okay, you want to earn it? All right, get a pen. Write this down. Here's what I want you to do. And they were ready for tithe. You know, don't look at porn. Be nice. Cross the street with little old ladies. Write the list of 10 commandments that we think that religion should be. And so they got their pens, and they're ready to go. And Jesus said, here's the work that you got to do. Believe. Believe in the one he sent. You want a job? All right, believe in me. If you put your faith in me, I'm going to give you grace you don't deserve. All you got to do is believe. And that's what he says to you today. To your weary, struggling heart, you've been looking to the things of this earth to satisfy you. And you say, how do I get saved? What do I got to do, God? And God says, believe in me. What does that mean? Believe he is who he said he is. Now, that, now let's not let's oversimplify that. That means you believe he is I am. That means you believe he is God. He actually clarified it. We didn't have a chance to read it. But he said, I need you to believe so deeply that you're eating my flesh and drinking my blood. You're like, that's cannibalism. No, remember, it's the metaphor of bread. He's saying, it can't just be my body, though. It has to be like all the way, me my death, too. You see, the, the, the flesh represents life. The blood represents death. He's saying, you can't just believe in me as a living teacher, but I'm going to a cross and dying for you. And you have to take the blood with the flesh. I mean, you have to believe in my death and my life. And if you'll follow me on that level, that's, that's all the way, but to believe all the way in there, then you'll have living bread that will satisfy you forever. Now, that was the point at which a lot of them said, this is getting weird. A bunch of them, a bunch of them started going like, you know, I was cool on you giving me lunch, but talking about your death, that's icky. I lost my appetite. And they started to realize he wasn't going to give out more food. So a lot of people in the crowd that day started to walk away. In fact, look at it, John 666. Weird, right? From that time, many of the disciples went back and walked with him no more. One of the only verses in the Bible where you read about thousands of people simultaneously turning their back on Jesus Christ. And it happens to be a 666, which is the number of man, man, man. We are made on the, on, on the sixth day. That represents our attempt to do life without God. And that was their decision, to turn their back on God. They could have got to seven, 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 but they turned on their heel. And they didn't want to follow Jesus because now it was getting intense about believing in his death. You know what Jesus did? He didn't beg him to stay. No, 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 guys. OK, OK, OK. I'll give you more bread. He, he, he was so confident. He actually turned to the 12 disciples and said this. Y'all want to go too? He wasn't going to lower the bar. He was saying, you, if it's too tough, please ring the bell. Go ahead, bail out. It's fine. I love what Peter said. Peter, Peter gets a lot of flack, but this, this, this one, he shined. Peter said, Peter said, where where are we going to go? To whom else shall we go? There aren't like a whole lot of people lining up to die to save me. There aren't a whole lot of people offering me living bread. To whom else are we going to go, Jesus? For you alone speak the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus actually said it of himself. I have God's stamp on my life. Look back just a couple verses. Jesus said, I have the stamp of the Father. We pick what we eat a lot of times based on the seal that's on it. 
you'll see a breakfast cereal that says, certified by the American Heart Association. It's always weird to me. That's like on a box of Lucky Charms. But we're like, OK, it's probably great. But there's a stamp on it. Jesus said, I, I'm God's son, and I got God's stamp on me. At my baptism, God the Father spoke from heaven and said, this is my beloved son. In him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. And that's what Jesus is saying. We've come to believe that you aren't just a guy giving out living bread. You actually are the son of God. I'm saying you should trust him in your soul because he is the only one with God's seal. Where else on earth can you go for living bread? Where else can we go? We may not like everything Jesus says. He never expected you to. He expects us to worship him because he alone has the words of eternal life. Would you pray with me? Father, we're grateful for this time in your word. Thankful that you would tell us who you are. We thank you that you are the bread of life and that even now in this moment, anyone who believes in you will be saved. While we're praying, their eyes closed and our hearts opened. I wonder if any of you are, is ready to give your heart to Jesus. You're ready to eat that living bread. Eating is both social and personal. You can eat with a group of people, sure, but it's personal because no one can eat for you. And even now in this moment, there's a social opportunity. We're around you. We love you. We want you to receive Christ. But it's also personal. You have to choose to give your heart to Jesus, and we can't do that for you. Listen, you're your girlfriend could if she would. Your mom could, if she could, she would. If we could believe Jesus for you, we would, but you have to do it for yourself. This is your moment. This is your time. Don't miss it. With heads bowed, eyes closed, all of us praying, I'm going to say a, a short prayer, piece, one piece at a time. And if you're ready to give your heart to Jesus, to believe in him, I want you to pray this with me. I'm going to ask the church family to pray it with us to show that we're with you in this decision. Say this to God. He'll hear you. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. I need your grace. I need living bread. I put my faith in your hands. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. Be my friend. In Jesus' name. What an incredible message. Thank you so much for joining us in this teaching from Fresh Life Church. If during this message you felt led to make the decision to follow Christ, we'd love to send you a 21-day devotional that goes through the book of John that Pastor Levi wrote. And you can also register your decision on our website, freshlife.church. Just click the Know God tab and uh, we'd love to get connected with you. If you've been impacted at all through what God is doing here at Fresh Life Church, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Um, all you gotta do is click the Share Your Story tab at the top of our website, or you can email us at story at freshlife.church and share how God is using this work to impact your life. And finally, if you'd like to partner with us financially um, and support the things that God is doing in and through this house, you can text the word FRESH to 45777. You can click the Give button, at freshlife.church, or you can give via the Fresh Life app. Thank you so much for watching.